said, do you love doing comedy enough that you're going to willing to do it for free forever? Hot breath. All right. Hot breath of verse. Welcome back to Hot Breath, the show where you learn comedy from the pros. This is our comic Q&A series we do in our Facebook group every single week. So if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it later, go into the description of the show, click join the Facebook group so you can get a part of more of these Q&As and all the other fun comedy stuff we have going on in there. But without further ado, there's no need to delay. Let's welcome to the show the man of the hour, Mr. Kyle Kinane, everyone. Let's give it up for Kyle. There we are. I love you. <laughs> Let's give it up in the vacuum of the internet. Yes. I did a, I did an applause sound effect for you, though, buddy. Oh, right. I know that's good. <laughs> so, um, so I'm so excited. Uh, first off, thanks for doing this. Um, there's a lot of fans in this group, but then also I'm just I'm a personal fan of you in general. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've seen you. I've seen you perform in Atlanta a few times, and you now coming out with your upcoming album on July twenty fourth. I think one of my favorite things about just seeing the evolution and growth of your comedy because you started in ninety nine, right, in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's been great to see just the evolution of your comedy and just your bits grow and grow. And something I heard you say. And um, people watching, feel free to comment with questions for uh, Kyle here, but I'm going to jump in with a few selfishly myself. But something I heard you say that really stuck with me is that you started to find your voice when you started writing jokes that like you were attached to. And I'd be interested to hear more about like that process because finding your voice is something all comedians and me, I'm just now 10 years in that I feel like I'm starting to get like, oh, maybe if I do a little more sarcasm, it works better. But like still being attached to material is something I'm trying to work towards. How were you able to do that? What was that process? Uh, I, I think with, <clears throat> I mean, they say like, well, there's no official timeline, but they say, what is it? Eight to 10 years is how long it takes to find your voice. And every comic that's four years in is like, no, I found my voice right now. <laughs> and then if you stay in it long enough, and get to 10 years, you're like, oh, I was uh, totally wrong. I was mm -hmm. wrong about uh, my voice for, and when I was four years in. But I think it's the difference that when you start, you're not really, you don't really know how to process your life and your life's experiences mm -hmm. into comedy yet. But you know how to write a joke. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, you can watch, you know, you could watch joke writers. You could watch Seinfeld. You don't learn anything about Seinfeld's life from watching Seinfeld's comedy. But that's that's joke writing. That's what you need first. Right. You know, you need you need that skill. And then you could take that skill and apply it to your actual life. And that, I think, is where you start to find your voice because you're like, oh, this is a situation that actually happened to me at the store or in a relationship. So it's truth. I'm talking my truth. But I also have this skill set of how to take that truth and put it into a format that is a joke. And that's where I think it starts to fall in, like, like you're saying, like you, like you lean into sarcasm more, like, oh, maybe that's my style, and that's how I convey the things I want to say. Not just like I, I, I look back at my early years of comedy, I know, like, oh, this was a setup and a punchline. It had nothing about me. It was just a joke, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you figure out that. It's more rewarding to I, for me. I find it more rewarding to like, oh, my my personal experiences. Like, well, we're laughing at my personal experiences, not punching down, but like I'm, I get to talk about myself. I think that's what voice is. You're like, but then again, I love Mitch Hedberg, and that guy never talked about his life at all. Yeah, and that your line on your first album where it's like you wake, you ever wake up and pretty much, it's like wake up and believe in yourself. Like that was almost like yeah. a spark for you. That kind of you started to use that as kind of a jumping off point to start building material. What was it about that line that really kind of opened up the next uh, level of your comedy? I think because I, I thought my life was in the in the best most humorous way pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and there's no uh, there's hardly any originality. The boy, the old, the dumb guy the dumb guy routine that's worked in uh, sitcoms from the dawn of television 
you know, the old schlubby boy. I'm looking at this Dumbo guy. <laughs> but if I was talking about specific situations in my life, you can't take that away from me. You can't tell me it's hack if it's in my actual life. Mm-hmm. If me, you know, if me walking through the grocery store drunk, holding a 12 pack, balancing frozen pizzas on it, just having a good time. Even though that's typical dumb guy shit, that's my that's what I did on a Saturday night, and that was funny to me that I was still happy in the midst of that being my lonely Saturday night. But yeah, it was I was realizing that also I had I was relating to a lot more people of like that was maybe if that was death of the party that was two thousand nine, but so that means those jokes were in the works in the mid aughts, mm-hmm. which was plenty of people that spent ridiculous amounts of money to go to liberal arts colleges thinking that you're you're right to pursue your dream and then all you got was debt and not a a career that was if you were lucky maybe distantly related to what you really wanted to do so i think that material struck with a struck a chord with a lot of people that were like oh yeah i don't think we're gonna get the life we wanted to even though we just spent you know tens of thousands of dollars on an education that was worthless Mm -hmm. and now we're in debt which we're seeing more of now and it's not i don't think it's barely even funny anymore because now the cost of education has skyrocketed compared to the cost to other compared to inflation and now it's now it's a total shit show right i was making fun of it before it was just a little bit of a shit show now it's a whole business (laughs) <laughs> but I think it, it related. I think the laughs I got from that was like, it was, maybe it was funny, but also that people related to it. And that's, oh. you know, when you watch a comedian, you're like, people love Jim Gaffigan because he talks about food. Guess what? Everybody has to eat to stay alive. You're going to relate to food. Relationships. Everybody gets lonely. They want to, you know, you know, regardless of, I think, you know, gender or sexuality you still there's still some inherent need to be with somebody so the idea of a relationship is still relatable to most people on earth so being a you know 30 something early 30s loser with student loan debt and a pointless day job related to a lot of people And that self-awareness, I guess, is what translates. It starts with like being aware of who you are and how you got there. And then maybe like letting your material bloom from that is what seemingly more personal. It's almost like the more universal and the material becomes. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you never want to be disingenuous. I mean, like that's the that's you wind up pricing yourself out of the market. If you do a good enough job complaining about how shitty your life is and being broke and having shitty day jobs. Well, then I got rewarded with a career in comedy. Well, guess what? I'm not broke and I don't have a shitty day job anymore. I'm not going to go and talk, act like I am. Cause then that just turns into Larry, the cable guy. And it's just hmm. a caricature of like, uh, oh, man, I'm only making $9 down at the pizza hut tonight. No, that's not the, the truth of my situation. Mm-hmm. So I got to try and make more relatable material now about, I mean, it's still, it's still dipshit, but what are you going to do? What, what is that decision for you? Because that's something a lot of comics also have to like think about when they are pursuing comedy is like, okay, balancing a day job and doing comedy at night. And you were working closed captioning for TV. And then like you basically quit your job and recorded that album we were talking about. It's almost seems like you had almost like a, a moment where you were just like, no, I'm going for this now. Yeah. I mean, I, I did move to Los Angeles to be a comedian. I didn't move to be any other thing. You know, it's, it's, I, it's a, I, I still like Los Angeles and it's great that you, there are these other options to like, Oh, maybe somebody wants you to write for TV or maybe somebody wants you to act. But I wanted to be a standup. I moved there for that. And I'd gotten a mate manager and I'd gotten an agent and I told him like, but I still, I mean, I'm from the Midwest. I don't do like the, if you just, I don't believe in the secret or any of that shit. Like if you just dream it and will it, it'll happen. It's like, no, you work. You just, you work. That's what you do in life. Mm -hmm. And then you want to be a comedian. That's great. You do that after you work. So when I was recording that album and going to quit 
my job because I, I had an agent. I'm like, I need you to tell me that you can book me enough work. Because even though I had a crummy day job, at least I knew I was going to get this much money a week and I could pay my bills. So I am I am very married to security a lot of the times, which is not great when you're pursuing your dreams. Like, well, but I, but this I'm getting health insurance from my day job. It's like, I uh, so yeah, that was what happened. Like, I'm like, all right, I'm going to put this album out. I'm going to go. And like, I need you to book me wherever. I just want the work. I don't care. I'll if, even if it's shitty. I just want the work. I that summer. Oh, it was 10 years ago this summer was the anniversary. I, I got all my CDs. I, was, I put them in. I had a pickup truck with a shell on the back. So I went out on tour and I was sleeping in that some of the nights and just <laughs> selling CDs. Like, I'll, go, I'll take all the lessons I learned from punk rock and DIY and just go sell the albums yourself. And be, so, yeah, that was it. I was like, I'm going to, I need to work. I can't do this like stay in between jobs and hope it comes together thing. I need to know that I have income. Yeah. I love that DIY approach. I mean, that's, that's what I'm all about, but what it took me probably, cause I just like self produce my own special and I, I self uh, produced my own tour last year. Like I'm all about DIY, but it took me probably seven or eight years into comedy to stop being like, but why isn't that club booking me? Or why why can't I get on that show? You know, all that like self-negative yeah. talk that just perpetually goes through comedians' head. Like how how are you able to overcome that? Yeah, yeah that is kind of sometimes the catch of DIY is uh it's it, it can be DIY up to a point where if you're doing something that's good and desirable, other people will want to help you do it yourself. But if nobody ever wants to help you do it yourself, maybe what you're doing isn't that good. <laughs> and that's some of the self, self-awareness self of like, I'll go out and make as many opportunities for myself. You know, but, I, you know, I, I'm worried about clubs. I don't care about, you know, clubs booking me. But I'm like, just any kind of recognition, even if it's, I mean, you get it right away in stand-up. You get people to laugh. So, you know, something's working. So outside of people laughing, did you get booked on another show like that? I knew there was no, you know, harder they come, harder they fall type thing. The faster you rise, the faster you fall. So I'll, whatever show I was on, I'm like, I need to be the best comedian on that show. No, that's an arbitrary statement, but I just need to do well, not Mm -hmm at the expense of somebody else and not punching down, I just need to do good on that show. Cause if I do good on that show, I'm talking about when I moved to LA, then people that are at that show might book another show. That's just a little bit better than the one I was just on. It's not like I did great at this hotel lobby basement bar. Now I'm going to be on the tonight show. No, that's not how it works. You do great on the hotel basement bar show. And then maybe you get booked at a bar show that has a few more people into it that like comedy. And then you get, they have better comics on that show. And those better comics see you do well and they tell people on another show. So you just kind of slowly zigzag upwards and that's how you guarantee the quality of it. Like I know I got what I got because I earned it, not because of a fluke, not because of, you know, you can schmooze all you want. You can make all the, you can network all you want. And you can, I've seen people schmooze their way on to good shows and then they bomb because they didn't put the work in first. I'd rather be asked to be on the show than ask somebody to be on the show. And I love that visual representation, like zigzagging your way to where you want to get, just being patient, appreciating the process and focusing on what you can control. You can control whether or not you're putting in the work to kill on stage that then someone sees and wants to book. It's focusing on what you can control and not some like validation. Well, and like, yeah. And like you're saying, that's the, you know, it's it's quality control and that's how, you know, you keep your own ego in check because I know that I earned what I got. Mm. I didn't hustle. I didn't schmooze. I didn't network. I, earned what I got. So if a club didn't book me, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to where I'm at. I know I earned it. 
And if it's time for me to go to the next level, I will know I have earned that next level. If I'm not making it to the next level, maybe I didn't earn that yet. Maybe I'm not putting the work in. I blame myself first before blaming anybody else. And what is always jealousy and this shit talking, but right. Sure. I mean, but... Still, is there still jealousy for you? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Wow. But it doesn't, do, it doesn't do me any good because right. all, you know, people get Netflix specials, people get, you know, and it's like, all right. <laughs> that, uh, and what, what, what am I going to do? <laughs> right. Here and be, be pissed about it, man. It, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it exists. Jealousy always exists. And I'll bitch about it around people. I know I can bitch about it around. Right. But then the, the end result is like, what are we going to, what I have a career. I tell jokes for a living. What, like why <laughs> I got the thing, you know? Yeah. And right. You know, what's, what's popular isn't always what's good. Ooh. I mean, we can, we know who the president is right now. Like mm -hmm. let, let, we don't have to go political with it, but what's popular isn't what's good all, all the time. Mm. Sometimes people that get a Netflix special, I'm like, hell yeah, they should have that special. And sometimes there's people I'm like, all right, well, that's the temperature of the world right now. Uh -huh. That's what people want. <laughs> and okay, I'm not that, I'm not what they want. So that's okay. Have, have you tried to get one on Netflix? Have you tried that route? I was on, I did the stand-ups, mm -hmm. which was like the, the half hour ones. And then, and to be honest, I this special that's coming out now I did a showcase and I, I had, you know, my representatives ask people from networks to come out and uh, come see this new hour. And uh, it didn't go great. So I did not earn that next step. I had people come out and I didn't, I didn't have a great show and that's on me. I should have been more prepared. I should have uh, been more focused uh, oh, through the set, I found myself wandering, thinking like, oh, it's like a road gig where I can kind of dick around. No, that's not. I, I made bad choices and mm -hmm. it resulted in uh, people saying no to this for, uh, you know, to being an on air or a streaming video special. So, But that I mean, that's that's very um, inspiring to hear someone at your level even be like, you know what? I dropped the ball on this. It wasn't some network that had a conspiracy against me. You know, I just didn't do what I needed to do to earn it. I mean, that, that takes a lot of self-awareness and like humility, humility. <clears throat> <laughs> what a great word to mispronounce. <laughs> of, of all the words to stumble on, that's the one. <laughs> I possess a great deal, Hamel. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> that was the perfect shit. word. Yeah. <laughs> the hot breath humility. That's what we're going to call it. Yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, I beefed it. I could have had a better set and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this was the wrong night to have a crummy set, but here we are. But we're seeing people like, um, uh, even like Hannibal Burris, um, who and Mark Norman and Sam Morell, who are like self-releasing or self-producing specials. Like, did you think about going that route, or are you just like, um, I'll just, I'll just throw the album out there and and get spins on Sirius and all that? Yeah, you know those those lucrative Spotify checks. Oh, but Sirius can be <laughs> quite. Some, well, Sirius is the one. Yeah. Yeah, Sirius can be some nice um, income. Well, that's why after somebody was, uh, after I got nose, you know, on um, all that stuff, I just, I decided like, why nobody needs, I mean, right now, where does comedy get consumed outside of like a net, like you listen to it. Mm -hmm. Why do I want to put the pressure on not only financing or getting, trying to find people to finance and I hate to, you know, <clears throat> sound like the, you know, the uh, liberal uh, criticism du jour, but like, who needs another straight white dude walking around on stage with a microphone? If if it's good comedy, it the audio will suffice. Mm -hmm. The visual is just a component that people it, they look at it once and then it's still they listen to it. So I'm like, I'll go back to an album. I don't know. I I am. Uh, you know, doing some animation with it. I put some effort into animation. That was the effort. I, I wanted to fully animate it. 
Whoa. With different st- with different styles, with like having different animators come in and take a bit and kind of do it like waking life style. Oh, that's where, cool. Like, each yeah. section, like each section would just have a different animator doing whatever they wanted, not animated Kyle on stage, because then that's the same thing I tried to avoid. So I have some of that. I have some small bits of that coming out. And I told I told one network, I'm like, listen, all the like like Comedy Central did say like, oh, we'd like to do a new special with you. And I was like, well, how about instead of taping it, let's just save the money that you would spend producing a live special and spend it on animation. And they weren't, they didn't bite on that idea. But I like that you're, yeah, I like you thinking outside of the, the box out of the form. Cause it is, there's so many specials now. It is kind of like, how can we stand out? And what unique spin can we put on it? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's all going to get chopped up into clips and right. uh, what can you share through a YouTube video. And so what people put that on and minimize it anyway, just to listen to it. So why spend all the money on the visual if that's not, I mean, I'm not going to spend my, I wasn't going to spend my own money on the visual aspect of it. Yeah, have you seen have you seen Hannibal's or any clips of it or anything? No, I heard I heard he messed around and did like not not in a bad way, but like yeah. did all weird stuff with it. Oh, it's wild. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a trip for sure. Did you start yeah, with him in Chicago? Yeah. He we didn't really overlap much. I, oh. I had left, he was around a little bit right before I left. I moved in two thousand three. Gotcha. He was around right toward the end, and then I remember coming back. And somebody's like, man, Hannibal got real good. I was like, Hannibal? Because was like, you see everybody at open mics and everybody sucks. Exactly. We all suck. And somebody's like, yeah, Hannibal got real good. I'm like, Hannibal? <laughs> and these, yeah. And now here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great because that guy doesn't, he only does things the way he wants to. And that's awesome. Yeah. It really is. It really is inspiring to see comics, yeah, doing things in their own voice in their own way. Yeah. So let's let's get into um, some of the fan joke uh, fan jokes fan questions here. Um, we actually had a few people that jumped in at the beginning because they're at work. They like jumped in to post right. a question and then left. They were like, "I just want to post this. I gotta go back to work." Like. Oh, well, fair enough. There's yeah, people yeah. I, I've had. There's a there's a comic named Chase Bonin who was like watching one. Um, it may have been the Dan Soder one, but he was like watching like from the bathroom of his job. He was just like, <laughs> it's funny to see. <laughs> I could have a job for too long. <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Kyle Groom jumped in here first. Oh, and he actually said, I'll be making balloon animals for kids during this interview. So I'll ask this now. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I have heard you say, paraphrasing, I'll take a good two-minute joke and make it into a mediocre five-minute joke. I think it's great. I just want to know your process on how to do that. Uh, I've always likened it to... Uh you know, again, it goes back to like when you like writing a joke that's about brevity and, you know, you know, how effective you use your words. Mm. But I wind up, I prattle on as evident in this interview that I get, I, I get into telling stories and telling yarns and that's, that's less on brevity and more on bullshit where it's like, all right, you know, you tell a story on Friday night and people laugh at it at a party. So then you tell it on Saturday night to a new group of people and the detail, the colors get a little brighter and the, and the measurements get a little bit larger and you, mm-hmm. you, you know, you start getting uh, you know, Irish storytelling as it's called. Mm-hmm. And, uh, by next weekend, now that five minute story is a 15 minute story because you got new punchlines and then, Oh wait, this old guy over here was looking at me real weird. What I, well, I did it. And that's what it, Oh, so you mean like it'll start off as like something like small and basic and then you start looking for details to then build the joke with? Yeah, I mean, that's like if you, I mean, if you know, any kind of when you enjoy uh, reading literature or something, it's like, well, you could say I walked up to the house or you could say I walked up 
the narrow sidewalk to the house. Or you could say, I walked up the narrow sidewalk lined with tulips towards the house. I walked up the narrow sidewalk lined with tulips towards the orange house with the blue awnings. I thought that color choice was weird. Last time I saw blue with orange was the Bears. And I don't even like Chicago Bears football. But man, let me tell you about when they won the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl shuffle. You ever hear that? That's a stupid song. There you go. That's all I mean by it. That's <laughs> You can make it's your it's you can veer off any way you want and make a joke out of any angle you want it's your story now mm -hmm. you got to pay attention I, am i losing the audience or are they getting confused by the end but you can talk about any detail you want about a joke i went to the store what's the name of the store what does the store specialize in was the clerk that checked you out to have a weird haircut when you went to the store like there's all those things, all those details that you can make little jokes about. I got a bunch of stories. I hate to do the plug of the new album, but there's no, like, please do. Yeah. It's an hour, well, it's an hour and 45 minutes in the last the hour. The first hour is the hour I've been doing the run. The last 45 minutes, I think is like three stories. <laughs> so what? <laughs> three I mean, stories I mean, over 45 minutes. That's incredible. But, but 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 it's it really isn't though. Like you watch a movie that's two hours long, and it's like if it's just a romance, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. There, you just told the story. Now, how can a movie be two hours about that? Same way as any joke can be that long. But for that movie to be captivating for that long is where the real craft comes in. And yeah, I mean, someone can get on stage and tell three stories that span 45 minutes, but to make them consistently funny and engaging and entertaining, that's where the skill set comes in. That's where I feel like you're not giving yourself enough credit that you just rambled off all these details about walking up to the house as if everyone has this reflex to be like, oh, but then the blue awning, and then I associate that with Chicago Bears. It's like, you know, I mean, there's there's a, there's a skill set, it seems, you've been able to hone that is now just like a reflex of this happened, but now I can put it through all these filters that add details and embellishments to really bring it to life. Well, that, that skill set develops when you only have 10 minutes of material and you're given a half-hour spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's, when yep. that, that's when that skill set develops. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah, good good storytelling tips. That was something a few people are asking about stories too though. So um yeah, we'll um we'll we'll and, go more. And any joke any joke you could throw one more added detail into it and get another thirty seconds out of that. I mean, it's harder to do when you're doing open mics and you only have five minutes to work with because you want laughs per minute. You wanna get you're not gonna go tell one five minute preps, you know, setup for a punchline at the end of your open mic set and be like, What are you doing? You're wasting my time. Mm -hmm. so it's hard to develop that when you're only doing open mics you really it's it's really only comes like when you do get longer spots and you get a little more, more time to kind of stretch out when you're on stage but you mentioned this earlier in the interview is like you first learned the basics of writing you first learned like how to even write a joke before you tried to start embellishing and building up all these huge mm -hmm. stories you kind of started with the rules and then you can break them once you know them type deal yeah, yeah, that's yeah. So like an you open mic, it still is. Can. Yeah, yeah. You still can't just go like, "Well, I'm interesting." Here, let me tell you about my life. Like, nah, you gotta have. Yep. There's gotta you know, be jokes. Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes can be boring as shit to listen to. You don't know if the guy doesn't know how to <laughs> tell a story. Who cares about his accomplishments? Mm -hmm. He's boring. And then you got a guy who works at a, you know works at an ice cream parlor who could be fascinating to listen to because the guy knows how to tell a story. So. Nice. So let's get into uh, the next one. Lee Hudson. He's actually uh, he's actually in the UK. Um, yeah. And he asks, what differences have you found when you've performed in the UK? Any observations on how the audience receives you? <clears throat> I, I mean, I haven't performed there a lot, but I'll say that I, they seem to reward the cleverness and the concise writing that I was mentioning, not mm -hmm. so much the uh, rambling storyteller thing. Especially, ooh, man, Ireland. Oof, if you perform in Ireland, you better get on it 
quick. They oh yeah. Not, <laughs> they do not suffer any meandering bullshit over there. They need, everybody's already funny in Ireland. Like I did a comedy festival there with Sean Patton and we're like, why? We didn't even know why they were having a comedy festival because everybody there was already funny. Like even the guy at the border, like checking the passport when you land at the airport, which I have had troubles with, with uh, legal issues with Canada. It's a story that's on the new album. <laughs> but uh, so la- landing in Ireland and having the guy like, oh, do you have paperwork for this festival? I'm like, I don't. They just told me. And he's like, ah, I'm just fucking with you. It's a comedy <laughs> festival. Hey, have fun. And then gave him like, how oh, you wearing a uniform and you're just dicking around? <laughs> Like, like, but like even easy stuff, like the guy driving us from the airport to the hotel is just yelling at somebody for stopping at a yellow light. He's like, go, yellow's just another shade of green. Hilarious. <laughs> like, that's, that's concise. That's quick. And so, yeah, I go up there and start like, well, anyway, I was hanging out. They're like, no, get to it. They want quicker stuff. But in, you know, in Eng- England, it was definitely, I think they, they seem to value cleverness uh even if it's not like and i don't want to say this the wrong way well worded uh like there's salesmanship involved in comedy mm-hmm. and i think cleverness is good but then sometimes salesmanship like if you've done comedy a long enough time you're like i know this is a hack bit but you're selling it well and so some of that stuff i think in rowdier rooms like they'll reward well-dressed hack comedy because they're rowdy they want to party you know and then they're drunk but yeah like that and you, you all, to find out what references that you don't realize are in your set that are so uniquely american that's always a weird one you like go through it and like oh they may not have this store or this and that but then you just try and mention something about healthcare, and you're like oh yeah that's actually much more of a developed system over here <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so nice but you got to be on you got to be on your game when you're performing over there especially especially as an american i think they're excited to uh drag drag your ass <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right let's get a um another one here from scott Liebowitz. we got a um a story question again. He asks, um, was your bit about the couch party that the cop crashed a true story? Yes. Yeah, that was... Uh... Now, again, there's an example of how, for some reason, and there is a bit about how it was a party about somebody buying a new couch or something like like I That had nothing to do with the story, but it just turned into a bit about, like, how do you get a couch? People just buy couches and shit. That became part of that story, mm-hmm. even though it's not. It's just a detail that there was a couch in the apartment of adults. And I made a one off like, I don't know, it might have been a party because somebody bought a new couch. And then I thought like, yeah, people at some point you start buying furniture instead of finding it. Damn, that's a whole new bit. But yeah, that was real about the cop coming down from upstairs because the guy died. <laughs> yeah, that part's real. What is it like being that's something. I want to get better at, and I think a lot of comics strive for is like, oh, this happened in real life. Now, how can I translate it to stage to where it's laugh, 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 laugh? So it's like that, that happens to you. And then what is the process for then starting to hone that into like a bit that is actually consistently funny? It's a lot of it is, you know, it's not always outward where, you know, you think a story has to be, the actual facts and the pacing of the events that happened have to be funny. Mm. And whereas again, there's nothing fu- like the fact that a cop came downstairs and had a nonchalant attitude and we were smart, like all the events were funny in that, but then, okay. Being panicky on a porch. Cause you're, you know, got a bunch of weed and underage drinking and stuff. Cool. Add details. Otherwise, Somebody could tell that same story and just be like, yeah, we were out there. We were all fucked up and this cop came by and he like didn't care. That's that story. That's this, that's what that story is. I thought it was way more funny to think about that there was somebody dead upstairs mm-hmm. and we were just celebrating life, not knowing that that's the opposite of it. Like death existed right there and how 
minuscule we felt in the moment like that's what i wanted to focus on is everybody's feelings uh-huh. and that's the where the story comes in is like internalize all the minutia again I, I always use the go to the store example because it's easy but you like i went to the store how were you feeling when you were at the store how what mood were you in what music was playing that made your mood that way or changed your mood that's how the story becomes funny is all the minutia that you get to internalize and process yourself. There's, you know, the physical events don't have to be funny. Hmm. You know, what are you processing? Why are you buying what you're buying at the store? What weird combo of things are you buying at the store? There's nothing to do with what happened in the parking lot at the store. It's just all more bullshit to throw on instead of writing a brand new <laughs> joke about some entirely separate occurrence in your life like no i went to the store here's 20 minutes about it and then are you are you writing it all out are you going on stage and just telling it from memory it's usually i try to do enough sets i can't get into the new york mentality of doing like four sets in a night i don't i don't like myself enough to do four (laughs) sets in a night i don't want to hear myself i don't like doing two sets especially like doing a comedy club after two sets in a night. I'm like, I don't want to hear my own voice for another 24 hours. But, uh, but like usually back, you know, back in normal times about every night I'd have a set or every other night. And, you know, you tell it and you like, I have, I have the bullet points written down. So that way I'm not married to any structure, but I'm like, you want to get to this, then to this, then to this. Uh huh. And if something really unique or fun happens, I'm pretty bad about recording sets and listening back to them. But if something really good, like funny happened, like as soon as I get off stage, I try to make a note on my phone or write down like, hey, remember this line that you said. Oh. So that way it's not glued in structurally, but it's floating around. Remember this other funny thing that happened when you told this story? And then by the end of the week, you got five more bullet points to that story that can float and move around and It'll, they'll find their place eventually. And then you go headline or feature somewhere where you got more time to tell that story and everything kind of starts finding its place. You're doing a, a weekend at a club. So you got five shows and everything can start falling into place after that. It's not very regimented. It's not, it's not great advice. It's real loose and sloppy and I forget things. And, uh, <laughs> it's not, I, my methods aren't good, man. <laughs> That's what I love interviewing like comics who've been doing it 20, 30 years. And it's like, they know the secret, but it is like, I mean, it works eventually. Like I've figured yeah. out a way for it to hobble together. Eventually there's no like scientific system to what most of us comics do. No, I'm sure every comic said it, but like, no, it's repetition. Yes. It's just do your reps. Yes. Go do another set. And the best bombing. Oh man, it's still I still bomb, and it it is such a weird like it feels good <laughs> to know that it can still happen. Yeah, because if you don't if you don't bomb after a while, you're not challenging yourself. Ooh, you're not trying. I like that. Oh, yeah. I know this. I know this formula works, and I'll give people a formula. People get fucking sick of a formula. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Or maybe people don't. Maybe, you know, who am I going to tell somebody who's doing a stadium, who's a comedian doing a stadium, and their formula sold that many tickets? And I'm out like, "Ah, I got to do a 200 seater (laughs) because I love challenging the audience. (laughs) What is what is like your most recent unforgettable bomb? Oh, I mean, well, now with all this stuff hasn't been like. Right. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I was in a bad mood at a show in Chicago where I was doing two nights at, at Dahlia hall. And the first night I was there, I just, I wasn't on my game. And I was like, I realized the material I was doing had a negative slant to it. And I wasn't delivering this negative material in a fun way. I was delivering it in like a, in, the, in another thing. And that's not fun. And that's not, people were not, it wasn't a bomb, but I, I ended the show going like, oh, I, it wasn't a good mood. Mm. You know, when, pe- when people laugh, but the comedy can be sinister. 
you know, and I don't, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to do, you know, sinister know-it-all kind of like, let me tell you how the world works. Right. My, again, it, you know what it was? It wasn't in my voice. You can write material even 20 years in that you think is good jokes, but if it's not in your voice, you'll tell the audience is like, oh, that's not why we like, that's not what's interesting about Kyle. You know, it's like if Bill Burr was like, you know what? I love my baby. And it, he, he could write a great joke about loving his kid and his audience would be like, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Shit yeah. on us. We like it when you shit on us and tell us that the world sucks, <laughs> even if the joke's good. Or if John Mulaney did the opposite. You know what? Kids are fucking stupid. Let me tell you about it. Be like, oh, no, John. No. <laughs> right. Why we like John Mulaney. <laughs> so... As much as I thought it was good material, it wasn't in my uh, my voice. Ah. And so, and then in LA, uh, LA, I bomb a lot. Like here's ten minutes of new stuff. Oh, I'm, it works in my precious little alternative rooms. But then I'll go to the improv or the Laugh Factory and comedy store, get my ass handed to me. All right. But you got to do that. Board. <laughs> so many comics do like find their comfort zone and then just keep hitting ground balls to that comfort zone. Yeah. I, mean, it's, I don't, I, that's not what's fun about comedy to me. Right. Like, I, like I, I want to be good at it, but I also want to enjoy it. Like you can get good at something because you figured it out and then you're bored just because you're good at it. Doesn't mean you're not going to get bored i don't want to get bored with comedy i have to find something else to do mm -hmm. i can't do anything else joel i don't have other skills i gotta <laughs> i gotta keep doing this oh you're in it now you're too far in i mean me 10 I years know. in i'm like there's there's no going back like it's it's a lifestyle now yeah at least you got pro lighting and pro gear for the podcasting i can't even get that together well, I have, I need this more than you do. This, this is my come up. I need this. You're yeah. You've, you're already there. You release specials. You're releasing this new album. I'm still like, Hey guys, remember, keep up with me. So. Well, at least, at least there's uh at least we're running out of comedians. At least, <laughs> <laughs> at least the world is short on comics. But Mark Norman was saying on here how he hopes it thins the herd a lot. Like all this quarantine, he's like, I hope it thins the herd. Get the weak ones out of the way. Does it? And well, just driving them into TikTok. And, oh <laughs> right. <laughs> Which like I saw I said, you're on now. <laughs> that, that's a management deal. They're like, you should be on it. I'm like, I don't know what to do. What? Uh, I don't even have. I don't even have the physical app. I send them. They're like, we'll just put your words up there and we just need videos of your face i'm like i'll send you videos of my face i don't know what happens on tiktok yeah i'm not on there but like i saw you post weeks. it huh yeah S i was like all right here it is if you think this is gonna do something then go but it's not gonna do shit so is 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 that how because i mean i don't i don't have any representation or anything i mean is that is that where the game is right now where like your representation is like Hey, we would really like you to do this. Make a TikTok. That's the next thing. I mean, is that is that the the rapport and the relationship? I just don't know. That with my current management, yeah, I have new management. Then they, they know my hesitation on all that stuff. Uh -huh. like, well, we'll do it for you. Just give us this. Like all it needs. I'm like, I don't even understand how it works. Like, just give us a video of your face, but then your bit will play in the background. And I'm like, all right. Because I'm uh, pretty much against the idea. And what is it? It's just an information farm for for China Chinese spies <laughs> or something. Yeah. I, yeah. I, so as long as I, but what, I don't know what you're getting out of me. I don't. I barely even use the thing. I you know it's not on my phone. I had it and it was just like just it was just a lot of boobs dancing. And I was like, all right. I mean, cool, but. Yeah, Again, I, I, it's, I'm also 43. It's I'm not supposed to understand it. But that's why I didn't know like why management would be like Kyle will do viral videos on TikTok. I just don't even see where the trans where it translates. Hey, you know, Joel. Neither do I. Okay. <laughs> neither do I. But if they have designs, if it means the comedy gets out there, that's all I want. That's if all that it, matters. The comedy gets out there within my realm of control cool if it if it's a flop 
Who gives a shit? It's TikTok. It's yep. for 12 year olds and cam girls. If I fail on that, that's was meant to be. Yes. I'm fine with that. It's not something you're looking to earn, as we'll say. <laughs> I I do I am grateful that I got to come up before social media. Right before. Mm. Just right before. So I got to see what it was like right before. And like I was saying, the <clears throat> YouTube stars, I'm glad. I'm glad they're millionaires. I don't think it's good comedy, but it doesn't have to be for me. I'm like I said, I'm 43. If you're, I don't, I shouldn't be a hit with 15 year olds. Right. I shouldn't not, I should not be popular with teens. I'm not going to try. You want to put it on TikTok? You want to put it up there? Go for it. But I know my audience is 30 and up, bald dudes, <laughs> tattoos, yeah. and musical <laughs> instruments they don't play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> what my comedy's for <laughs> alright well let me, uh, let me get to a few more here and we can um, we can start to land this plane um, we I really give shorter answers too I, we appreciate your time oh dude Sean Patton went I mean you, if you give him a, <laughs> if you give him a comedy topic he will go uh, so, so it's that's you, that's that's the prime <laughs> example of why of of what's good isn't always what or what's popular isn't always what's good is that sean Patton should be oh. uh the biggest stand-up comedian uh working some people are getting what they deserve i'm like i, I know sam J is getting a netflix special yeah it's one of the people where i'm like yes okay put her up there mm -hmm. yes but sean Patton, as a, it's it's, uh, I think that's criminal that he is not more well known. Oh, I mean, I remember seeing him in Atlanta. Like, I watched several of his shows in a row when he last time he was at Punchline, and like every single show was completely different and absolutely hilarious. And I'm just, I, I was like watching it, like, I don't even know what's happening, but he's murdering and it's hilarious. And each show was like just a unique experience. I'm just like, how, you know? Well, and I look at him as an influence of like, that's like when you let your imagination yeah. take control, like when you just get some sort of bridle on your imagination, so you can just hold the reins and then let it like, we're going to go into weird court, like he'll start bits like the bit he has a bit about how childbirth sometimes gives their mother's orgasm. So I'm like, <laughs> All right, man, let me see you. Let me see you do this. <laughs> Let me, I love the challenge that you just created for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling a group of strangers this fact, and then you're going to try and make comedy out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah. He talked about, uh, your actually, your bit actually getting pulled over by the police on a bicycle. Cause someone had asked about physicality yeah. and he used that exact, that joke as an example of you being physical on stage and like painting the picture without even saying anything. Oh, yeah, you know, me and my mime work. I love that. God, I love comedians. Yeah. We're like, Kyle Kinane's brilliant. And then you're like, yeah, cool. I can pull you off 20-minute stories that are hilarious beginning, middle, and end. Cool. It's like, no, I mean. Pretended to ride a bike on stage. Give me a goddamn Oscar. <laughs> but to see the evolution of that joke, because there's like an older version of that joke online as well, where you're saying the joke and it's a little bit more edge, it's a little bit more anger, and you're not acting out anything. And then to see the final product, I think you're at a festival or something, to where you have the act out, your pacing's a lot slower. You like it, but to see the evolution of that joke, you know, I mean, it's fun. It's fun, and there is a skill involved with painting a picture with just a microphone. It's the irony of like getting somebody like you get these festivals that want to tape like, you know, just for laughs and we're going to tape. And it's just this kind of papered funneled in audience that isn't even ready for comedy. And that's what gets the most views on YouTube is you eating shit <laughs> in front of people who some of them English is their second language. Like there's one thing that keeps getting aired is when I was in Amsterdam. And like the whole audience, like English is their third language. And I'm like, this is the worst Hilarious. Clip to get the most, like to be the example of what gets there. I'm like, but here's this one where I did it in front of 10 people. And 
it's great. And that one is you know, like 20 years. <sighs> Can't control it. So, oh, we've got um, we've got one that's about your joke development. This is actually from Chase Bonin. Who says, um, the I Heart Squirters joke. How long did it take you to get... I love comedy, by the way. It's like we're talking... <laughs> Like, it's a fine wine. The I Heart Squirters joke, Mr. Kinane. I'll put a little um, context on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a slogan on a t-shirt of somebody in the front row, not a personal belief. In but that's what he said. Um, how long did it take I you to... different to squirters. How long did it take you to get that album worthy? And he's asking this because that was his buddy that was wearing that shirt. <laughs> well... Album worthy? I mean, when was that show? I, I'll look at my calendar right now. Because that show where the guy was wearing that shirt was maybe three weeks before I take that special. Whoa. So, I'm going to look. I want to look. Right, I'm looking right now. Hold on. Because <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was taped in May of May 16. Let me see. April. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to find it right now. Yeah, please do. It. Hold on. Yeah, I think that was uh, probably just a few weeks beforehand. That's awesome. Uh, that 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 went down. What a small world that that was his friend that was wearing that shirt, and now he's sitting on a Q and A with you. <laughs> I believe that was uh, was that. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. It was uh, it was new uh, not New Orleans, Lafayette, Louisiana, which I just had to put off. Oh yeah, I, I was there last year. You're in Lafayette. Oh, J- oh JP. JP, uh, yeah. JP Leonard. Yeah. yeah. We won a JP Leonard show. You know what? Now I look like an idiot because I cannot find exactly when that went down because I'm looking for when I was there. And I, but I really did think it was right before then. It's no worries at I all. To it. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So I, I, I apologize for getting people excited about that. But it's something um, you had to throw together fairly quickly. Because if it was just a few I weeks, you didn't have to thinking. do anything. A guy, a guy wore a <laughs> I Heart Squirters t-shirt. What did I have to do? Other than report back. <laughs> report back. A guy, that a guy wore that on a shirt. Yeah, that's true. That's all I had to do. I didn't, there's no, all I said was I, the guy wore an I Heart Squirters. That's, <laughs> that's all. That's what happened. <laughs> All right. no bit. That guy was the guy was the bit. <laughs> that, was, that was journalism on my part. That was even comedy. No offense to the guy wearing the I Heart Squirter shirt. I hope, I hope his love continues. So um, yeah, maybe we, we could just kind of jump through a few and just kind of give them some peppered answers. Um, yeah. This one, and you've already touched on this a little bit, but uh, Scott Porteous actually says he saw you in. Um, Where'd it go? Oh, he saw you in Winnipeg, and it was a treat. So that's cool. Oh, man. Old, uh, was that uh, Duff on Duff's uh, show last summer? R.I.P. John Duff. Anyway, was that a question? Uh, No, his question was, uh, what, and you already talked about storytelling tips, but are there any more, I guess? He says, what tips do you have for anyone who takes a storytelling approach to comedy? I, I mean, I mean, for practice, try to make something boring, interesting. Huh. You know, I just see if you like, you got to go mow the lawn. All right. Start, start writing down details about mowing the lawn. See if you can make that into a joke. If you can do that. Then, you know, you could take any situation, tell a story about it. Again, it doesn't have to be the outcome of the, the, the physical outcome of what happened in the story. You know, it doesn't have to be an epic tale. It could be just something pathetic and mundane and that's what's interesting about it and what do you this can kind of tag on brody blair's question but his is pretty much like when um how do you write when you feel like nothing is happening in your life how do you find motivation to write i don't i I mean i don't like force it some people can go and sit and write jokes and i don't i can't do that I mean, if nothing's happened in my life, I try to make my life more interesting. I'd try to do, I mean, I'm not like an exercise guy, I like bike ride, but just anything like get the blood flow and get like, feel like 
mental health, mental and physical health uh, plays a lot into for me to do comedy. Yeah, me too. Like if I'm, you know, I don't write, you know, I might write about being bummed out, but I only find things that I can make things entertaining when I'm in a good mood. If I'm bummed out, I'm not really in the mood to create comedy. I'll write down details while I'm bummed out and then maybe later it'll turn. But yeah, I, uh, yeah, mental mental and physical health, like even just go take a walk, go ride a bike, get some blood moving through you. Um, it's counteracts, uh, you know, any kind of de- depressive qualities you might have. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's not, an, it's not a cure-all by any means, but that kind of stuff. If nothing's happening, go make something happen. Go move around. Go try and try and improve your quality of life. Is that your similar strategy? Because Barrett Kyle's asking about overcoming writer's block. Is that how you overcome writer's block? Is just like go do things? Every time, uh, uh, usually about once a year, I'll get to the point where I'm like, oh, I stripped out that gear of comedy. Like I can't write more comedy. Mm -hmm. I don't, I lost it. And that's going to happen. That's writer's block, whatever you want to call it. Writer's block to me always is like, I sat down to write and I can't write anything. I don't ever do that. That's not my process. But it's like, I haven't written a new bit that I like. I've written bits where I'm like, I try to force some or try to force something to be funny that's not. Once a year, with this this year being the exception with everything that's going on. But then I'll just have a, a month-long streak of just eating shit on stage with material that I don't believe in and trying to make work and it just won't work and uh just have faith that that it will go away you don't you don't get to know how long it's gonna last but eventually it does go away and eventually you write one joke that is funny and you like it and then you feel good about that joke and because you feel good you write more jokes because you're in a better mood because that one worked and it just takes a while sometimes to get to that there's no I don't have any proven technique. It's just, man, ride it out. It sucks, but ride it out. Yeah, that that's something we all need to hear. Even like a comic at your level is like, we all go through those ruts, but you, you've got to keep keep moving forward. Like, don't stop. Like, just keep getting the reps in and you'll break out of it eventually. Yeah. Well, you get caught up trying to live the lifestyle of this the, the person you create on stage. Like, oh, I'm a boozing pizza eating do whatever kind of guy it's like yeah but sometimes to keep writing about that lifestyle you can't be that lifestyle you know mm. you can't maybe sometimes you gotta take a week off and as I, I i i don't like jogging but as i call it take your tits out for a shake and go, uh, you know go <laughs> run around <laughs> and uh you know shake off the cobwebs take you know tits out for a shake. yeah go go Take, oh. take your jugs out for a jiggle and get uh, get get uh, dust off the cobwebs, because uh, yeah, every night of boozing and being in a permanent state of hangover and drunk, uh, as much as all your creative heroes may have put off that they lived that lifestyle, secretly there's moments where they got up early and had a cup of coffee and had some clarity and mm. got to work, you know. Yep. So. Yeah, your your word choice is it's just so precise. Do you when you're like writing a joke will, to punch it up, will you say like, "Hey, maybe there's a funnier word there?" Because I'll see your words even just getting a laugh just because of what it is. Oh, always. Yeah. There's so many words to choose from, and I am always falling the rut. I I curse too much, and I get sick of myself. And there's. You could say the same sentence 10 different ways with a, with a thesaurus. Huh. And why? And I don't want to ever do it to sound pretentious. It's just like, again, it's like, well, you got different shirts you can put on every day. Why you why, you know, well, that's why not? Why, why not change it up? Just because then it's fun to say. Then it's like, it's like you're more excited to say a bit because you got a new silly word to put in. I love it. I love it. And uh, the final, yeah, the final one here is um, Rock Allen just asking if you've ever had any negative blowback from a bit. Um, oh sure, yeah, all the time. I'm one. I'm, I'm going to say all the time, but 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've spouted off about some uh, gun control issues that I wasn't educated on before I started spouting off about stuff. But uh, and, uh, plenty of stuff. I talk out my ass, you know, about a lot of things. And uh, sometimes have heard people like, well, actually, you know, you get the well, actually culture. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing huge. I'm shit, man. I've tried to get blowback. I mean, I thought I've tried to get blow- cancel. <laughs> I, I thought with cancel culture, I can get that Trader Joe's bit some some traction again. <laughs> like I did all the accents. I love it. You're- I get fired from Saturday Night Live. Well, how about this? I do all these accents. Your before. management's like, can you do another accent joke? We'll put it on YouTube. It'll go viral. <laughs> oh, God. yeah. Well, not now. You got to put it. I mean, I had pictures that I was like, put them out. I'm like, here you go. Instead of somebody else finding it, finding it, this is what I put online. My sister got some kittens like 13 years ago that I just used. I discovered. Uh, Microsoft Paint or whatever, and just wrote horrible things on these pictures of these kittens <laughs> that I thought were hilarious because it was so over the top because it was pictures of kittens. Mm-hmm. And I put them out like, hey, I, this is something I did years ago, but if you want to cancel me for it, here you go. Because at least I'm putting it out there instead of somebody else like, can you believe he did this? I'm like, yeah, I did this. Nobody cared. Just racist, racist kitten pictures. <laughs> Nobody cared. Trying to get some heat releasing the new album here. He's like, I, I got to get canceled so I can get some downloads. <laughs> oh, fuck. you got to get picked up to get canceled. I'll play that. <laughs> well, you've got the hot <laughs> breath bump now. Okay. You've got the hot yeah. breath bump behind you. So uh, this is what brings me down. Oh, no. No, bump up. We're bumping. <laughs> We're bumping here. This is a. <laughs> this is how, This is when people finally start to look for the racist kitten pictures. All right. This is this is the trampoline in your ditch. This is the trampoline that's going to propel you, which is the name of your new album. Hey, look at that segue. Sure, sure, sure is. Sure is. Good call. Yeah, but what? Um. Yeah. Is there anything? Where will people be able to get it? Because we'll release this. We can release it the week of if you want, so we can kind of get momentum into the actual launch. Um, yeah. What are I the mean, details? You know, streaming on the streamers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's had, it's kind of coming out again. Uh, new management has given me a lot of information like, all right, it's exclusive on Sirius this weekend. And then next weekend, it's going to be exclusive on Pandora. I'm like, wow. I don't know. Um, July 24th, July 24th is when it releases. Stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, we'll be sure to promote anything you post about it as well. We're 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 here to help. We're all about comedy and helping comics. So whatever we can do. Hey, that's good. Well, I appreciate it, man. And is there is there any closing advice like for comedians, like your favorite comedy advice you've gotten or just anything that's always stuck with you through your career you could kind of leave us with? Uh I my my guarantee like if you're new or just you know, anybody focusing on like, you know, I'll see like, well, how do I want to make a career? I'm like, no, don't ever use the word career and stand up in the same sentence. If, if, if you're, I've always tell people like, do, do you love it enough that you'll do it for free forever? Mm. <laughs> That's how, like, if you can't say that sentence, don't, don't do comedy. Like it's, it's a bar sport. It's like darts or pool. <laughs> you can be really good at it and you can be the best person at darts in that bar. And then maybe you'll get so good at darts. You'll get to go to other bars and maybe get free nachos, <laughs> and free beer to play darts at those bars. But think about how many dart players pay their bills from darts <laughs> It's not a lot. So you just got to be one of those people who loves playing darts after work. You're going to go to work. You're not going to quit your job so you could travel playing darts for a couple beers in different bars across the country. Maybe, maybe you'll get to that. But to start, do you just like going to an open mic and trying to come up with new material? Not do you like doing the same five minutes every week to get laid 
or to get the predictable laughs? Do you like going to open mics because you want to write new stuff, whether you bomb or not? You love the challenge of it. It's it's a puzzle that doesn't get finished. That's what's great about comedy. Mm. There's no end to it. So for people to think like, oh, I just need to get the act and then I'll get all this. No, no, no. The act is never done. There's no, like, however many specials I have, all that is is just just one movable scale across. This is a material that excited me at this time. Now, this is what excited me at this time. And sometimes it overlaps. And I've screwed up by doing a joke from one special on another one. So I don't listen to anything in the past. I just have rewritten it. And now it moves over here. So that's it. Do you love doing comedy enough that you're going to willing to do it for free forever? That, wow. That's that's a level of commitment that like, yeah, this is just my hobby that I I'm lucky enough for right now to make a living off of. That's some of my favorite. Goes away. Mm. I don't know what to do. I love it. Yeah, that's some of my favorite comedy advice. That's the perfect analogy. Yeah, it's a bar sport. Yeah, so listen to that, comedians. Remember that. So, um, Kyle, thank you so much for doing this. I'm going to hit the round of applause again. Our sound effect here. Oh, we got one at the buzzer. Do you think Hannibal Burris would do this show? I cannot speak for Hannibal. That guy is his, <clears throat> he's his own little, he's his own planet. <laughs> weird, he's his own. Yeah. He's his own weird little planet operating in a solar system that is not ours. Well, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to get a Tesla roadster over to him. So we'll definitely reach out to him. Um, Kyle, thank you so much for doing this show, man. It's been an absolute thrill. Everyone's you saying, bet. thank you, Kyle. This was awesome. Very informative. Very nice. Awesome. All right. Hop yeah. breath the verse. We'll go forth. July 24th is when the album officially drops. Go support Kyle. Yeah. Trampoline in a ditch. If you're serious about becoming a comedian, join our Facebook group linked in the description below to start getting tips like these every single day and watch this playlist of our top writing tips to improve your writing today.